and welcome to the Student Hub Live. My name's Karen Foley and I'm a lecturer here at The Open University and today's event is an event from the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. But it's open to everyone, so welcome to everyone who is participating online. We have a ram-packed programme for you today with some of our academics from around the faculty who are going to be talking about a range of issues that relate to Brexit. So it's the 3rd of May, there's lots in the news and uh, let me tell you what we have in store for you today. Firstly, we're going to talk about what is the EU, um, and I have colleagues here from uh, political studies, geography and psychology to think about how we've constructed the EU, both geographically, physically and politically. We're then going to take a look at the impact of Brexit on the nations of the UK, and then take a look at environment and sustainable development, finally taking a look at the economic impact of all of this. So, the next two hours are going to be filled with activity and excitement, and you can share your voice and take advantage of this too. So, what you need to do is engage in the chat. Now, there are two options to engage with these events. There's the watch only, which is just the live stream, so you'll just see the video link. Or you can watch and engage, and to do that, you sign and using your student ID or your staff ID um, and if you don't have one of those you can check out the frequently asked questions section on the website and get one and then you'll be able to see the chat and also engage with the widgets. Now you should see some of those on the screen right now. We'd like to know where you are, how are you feeling today, which subject you're studying, at what level and also whether or not you've ever attended one of these events before. You can also chat about your opinions about Brexit or what you've had for breakfast or how you're finding your OU studies, whether you're doing an EMA soon or whether you're choosing a module. Anything goes in that chat box and those comments are going to be fed into us by our hot desk team, which is Sophie and HJ. Now let me introduce you to them. Sophie and HJ, thank you for coming along today. How are things? Morning. Yes, all good here. Uh, it's really nice to see some regulars and some newbies in the chat, so fingers crossed. Um, it will be a nice little, uh, nice little session, I think. Yes, um, I think we're just excited and ready to go. We're um, some people are procrastinating from assignments, but I think we could just get away with calling this research. Oh, definitely. Yes. And you, you're up early. <laughs> we've got you up. We've got you ready for the day. I yes. think. So it's good. <laughs> It'll be good preparation overall. But uh, yeah, any thoughts, comments, or questions for the studio? Just let us know, and uh, yeah, we'll put them to our panelists. We're very excited today. Now, this event is live and interactive, but the catch-up will be available shortly afterwards. If you aren't in the Watch and Engage, you can also share your views um, by uh, tweeting, and the hashtag is studenthublive17, um, or you can email us at studenthub um, at open.ac.uk. So please do that. Now, the chat can move quite quickly, and there are a few options to engage with that. You can change the view at the bottom right-hand side of the screen. You'll see some different options for the layout, so choose the one that suits you best, whether you want the screen or the chat larger. And there's also a little pin button at the top of the chat. So if things are moving fast and you want to follow up on something someone said, you can just select the pin and then scroll down and engage with it in that way. But whatever goes, just enjoy it um, and participate. So let's move on to our first session. I'm delighted to welcome Richard Richard Heffernan back, um, Alan Cochrane and Volker Patient. This session is about what is the EU, which is a very, very big question. And I think what's interesting about this conversation is that obviously from a political perspective, Richard, you'll be able to fill us in in terms of recent updates, etc. Um, but also Volker adding a psychological perspective and Alan a more geographical one in terms of boundaries. So uh, Richard, can you fill us in then um, in terms of, of where things are at right now? So the role of the EU, we've got some widgets up there that we'd like people to vote on, things around making us more British, um, member states joining the EU in the first place. Um, very interesting question you've posed here. If the EU didn't already exist, would we invent it today? And is today's EU fit for purpose? So you'll see those widgets coming up on the screen. Please do vote and we'll feed those into the chat. So Richard... Kick us off then, the EU then, can you fill us in, I mean, the last 60 years in terms of the widening and deepening um, aspect and, and, you know, thinking about what is the EU, how much of it is a union and how much of it is a political? Oh, well, it's hard to fit 60 years of history into 60 minutes of conversation. And uh, as people know following the news that uh, the EU is a movable feast. Presently, as it exists today, it is an international organisation of 28 member states, one of which remains the United Kingdom, which is determined to leave and is in the process of negotiating its exit. Uh, it is a, a European uh, a union of uh, economically integrated states that has a political uh, union in order to manage that integration. So if you decide to uh, engage uh, collectively across the 28 member states, as the European Union member states have done in terms of cooperating on the freedom 
of movement of capital, labor, goods and services. You need to have a framework of international agreements that negotiate and establish the way in which the uh, relationship between the states works. So it is a European association that helps govern the states of the members. Most member states have joined at various times, began as six uh, contracting members who formed a coal and steel community in the early 1950s. That then became the European Economic Community in 1958. The six became nine, became 10, became 12, became 15, 25, 27, and now 28. And it's widened across Europe, began in Western Europe, then moved south, then moved north, and then moved uh, 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 east. Um, and um, it's a very big, uh, sui generis international organization that has enormous impacts on the way politics is done in uh, each member state. And like any political endeavor, it has its supporters and its opponents. And in Britain, as citizens know, we were asked last June uh, if we wanted to remain a member of an organization that we first joined in the 1st of January 1973. We decided by 48% uh, uh, to 52% that we wanted to leave. And so the government now is charged under the new uh, uh, Prime Minister, Theresa May, who succeeded uh, uh, David Cameron, uh, having indicated our intention to leave by triggering what is known as Article 50 last Mar la la at the end of March, we now begin the process. And like any divorce, it is a protracted uh, uh, engagement in which we have to separate from the European Union, which involves us renegotiating our relationship with what's going to be called the EU 27. Though as of now, we're still in uh, and we're in the process of leaving. Alan, I wonder if you'd like to say anything. I mean, Richard's touched on the whole issue of borders and things. And, and of course, with this divorce process, as you refer to it, Richard, um, you know, th there are issues about, you know, temporality here. So in terms of what has happened and what will happen in the future. But this whole issue of borders um, really relates to something that you were very keen on about it, a Europe of the, the, ne the regions. I think, I think one of the interesting things about the European Union is how it's conceived both as a, a member organisation of nations and, and the Council of Ministers is made up of is made up of the, the representatives of the various nations that make up the members. But there is also underlying some of the political debates and indeed to some extent the economic debates, the possibility of thinking about it as a, as a different sort of entity in which the regions become important. And some of the, this has been one of the things that's driven uh, some of the Europe-wide uh, activity of, uh, of the European Union. And you'll find that there are a lot of programs of one sort or another which focus on the regions of the European Union. There are planning frameworks, there are regional development frameworks, there are a whole range of things which come in and come and go at different times but which do have a regional focus. And some of those regional focuses or foci um, actually construct regions which cross boundaries as well as being within nations. I mean, if you look at the, the way in which um, many of the c uh, countries of the European Union are structured, they do have regional forms of governance. So they do have agencies which work and, 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 and can negotiate in a way that actually uh, the UK hasn't in a, in a very clear way. Um, it has a bit more of that now than it used to have, but uh, it didn't have. Um, and I think what's interesting then, though, is the fact that the possibility that some of the arguments about whether there are, there are organizations which cut across borders. And that's something that's happened in, in, in a number of places. I mean, it's, it's common. Holland and Germany is perhaps the most famous one. But I mean, it, there was a lot of talk at one time, which I don't think it really got anywhere very far, but the notion of a region which would be called La Manche, which somehow joined up uh, Nord Pas-de-Calais in France and Kent in England. I think that's probably um, one of the triggers for um, the vote uh, to leave that, uh, in, in parts of Kent. But anyway, it was understood to be the possibility of building linkages across borders, of, of redefining those borders. Now, that, that's always, in a sense, been in tension with some of the other aspects of, of, of the European Union, which have been uh, driven by understandings of the different nations that are members, the different states that are members. But they do, they, it is interesting to explore what those tensions are. Even the early days when the, 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 the uh, coal and steel community was about restructuring some of the old industrial regions. And that's one of the things that has carried on, in a sense, through the, uh, through the, through the time of the European Union. 
Thank you, Alan. And I'm sorry for those of you, we had a little technical blip there, um, and I'm glad that most of you have managed to rejoin us by refreshing your screen. So sorry about that. I'm not sure quite what happened there. But um, it is worth just saying that if there are any technical difficulties, refreshing often works. Um, but we also do have a technical tab. So if there is anything that you're struggling with in terms of engaging, then do click on that, and Sophie and HJ will do their best to help you there. We asked you um, to vote on, on um, a question uh, about uh, does being European make us less British? Um, and the options are yes, no, or not sure. So you've got three options there to have a look at. And I'd like to, um, to find out where our audience have positioned that before we talk to Volker um, a little bit about um, the, the, social, the psychological aspects um, of this dialogue. So let's see what people said about this question. So we've got 14% saying yes and 71% saying no. So, Volker, what might we interpret then from this widget? Really, that's very interesting. The, um, um, I mean, kind of perhaps talking a little bit about, about the psychology here, it might be useful to frame that, you know, when, when we talk about the psychology, there's, there's lots of different ways in which we can think about, about the about the EU and about the referendum. Uh, I mean, the results you just, you just showed there suggest that, you know, 71% of people in the audience consider themselves to be European, in, in a sense. That would be my interpretation of that, looking at that. Um, to me, as a psychologist, uh, uh, and, and I think listening to Alan and, and Richard as well, uh, is on one hand, the EU is this fantastically complex and, and quite often very abstract entity, um, which we've seen, there's a, there's a great level of detail. Uh, my, my interest in, in, in that is that um, most people in, in, uh, you know, uh, in, in the electorate and the population probably do not appreciate just how complex, how fiendishly complex and detailed this organisation actually is and, and the influence it actually has on our lives. Um, we were talking briefly before before the uh, before this um, talk um, about you know to, to what extent you know are people aware that the EU has an influence on their lives in their daily lives you know and uh, and I think that's very difficult to pin pin down so good question to ask is where do people get their idea of the EU from and uh, and as we've seen in particular I think around the time of the referendum. There, were, there was lots of media coverage about, about the EU, some of which was very inaccurate, uh, misrepresented. Um, there was a lot of um, uh, what you would call um, fear-based appeals around the EU, particularly around immigration. And, and those, in a way, they became synonymous with the EU. And, um, uh, you know, I, I very much question, you know, how, how, how much people really understand the EU. And we know from psychology that when people are faced with a very, very deep complexity, there's uncertainty around it. Uh, one of the problems with the EU is, is uh, somewhat intransparent to most people what actually goes on in the EU. And, and these kind of things, they require people to simplify psychologically and cognitively simplify what they what they perceive the EU to be, and 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 as a result of that simplification, lots of detail is lost. Uh, we know uh, also that uh, once people have formed a view of of an entity like the EU, uh, uh, any other information that they get may may be discarded if it does not um, correspond to their initial view. Uh, so we know there are some cognitive biases that influence people's understanding of of, of complex situations. And and what's interesting, particularly in in relation to the referendum. Uh, and, and looking more deta in more detail at the referendum campaigns and how uh, the EU was branded both by the Remain campaign and by the Leave campaign. They're very different brand messages around that and, and how people um, uh, accept or endorse those kind of messages is really important in terms of how people form their opinions um, and, and, and ultimately, um, I suspect, you know, influencing their, their decision to vote one way or the other. Mm. So what might there be in terms of more reliable options to gauge then how people interpret some of these things? Well, it's, it, that's a really interesting question as well, because, uh, I mean, one of, one, of the, one of my thoughts about the, the way in which the campaign was, uh, was, was led was, was a question about the, the, the political standards, the minimum standard that we should expect of political campaigns. And, and of course, uh, you, you know, I mean, to some extent, there's a sort of idea that, you know, all politics is lies to some extent. Uh, I think that's a kind of perception of politics. Politicians often lie, uh, but but in terms of I think particular the kind of argument you know the fear-based arguments around particular you know around immigration and misrepresentation of, of of statistical facts. So in terms of you know Swedish rape statistics or, or you know immigrants coming into the country and what it would mean for you know and and 
and, and the way in which these kind of ideas were being connected uh, together, you know, raised some questions about the kind of standards of campaigning uh, that we should expect. And of course, the other thing, uh, a really good example of this is the, the claim about the 350 million per week uh, extra that the N NHS could be paid. And I mean, that was exposed as a, as a, as a, as a fabrication back in, I think it was February, January or February before the referendum. Yet the, the claim was allowed to persist. There was no, there was no way of, of kind of curtailing that kind of, that kind of message, even though it was clear, clear that it was a fabrication. And, and so I think there's something there about the standards of political campaigning. And of course, that, that also comes, you know, raises sort of questions about, you know, uh, the role of the media in actually shaping uh, political campaigns uh, and the independence of the media and so forth. So that's one, one, one of the issues there. Uh, I think there's another, uh, potential um, issue really in terms of the, the political education of, uh, of, of, of the British public. You know, how much do people actually really understand politics other than through the sound bites or the kind of uh, the game playing that goes on, you know, prime minister's question time and so forth. Because those are the kind of images of politics that people see. And, um, and I think, uh, and then finally, I think there's this issue around, uh, you know, austerity and, and the impact of austerity on, on people's lives. Um, um, you know, people people were angry, and, and uh, some some of the work that some of my colleagues are doing around trust is we know that there are some really angry distrust distrusters. You know, people who are angry because of what's happened to them economically and, and socially, uh, who have a very deep distrust of of the of the establishment and 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 and. I suppose in terms of understanding why we had a leave outcome was that the uh, the leave campaign uh, in a way connected with 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 those kind of angry distrust uh, distrusters to, to provide uh, an alternative to what the establishment message was. The interesting thing, of course, is now we have, uh, you know, Brexit, Brexiteers in, in Parliament who are also part of the establishment. So actually nothing has changed. Um, but at the time, it seemed like something was about to change, and that, and that is what connected with a lot of voters. Mm. We had our discussion, Richard, um, you know, days after the referendum, where we were thinking about this issue about, you know, to what extent it's, it's a good way of deciding policy by having a referendum and, and asking people. And, you know, Volker, you're sort of talking about here the ways in which we play up things, so how people are perceiving things and how the media is interacting um, with various concerns. But right here, right now, I guess, you know, we're at a point where people are saying we need to move forward with, mm. with the this dialogue and it's now about what we do and how we deal with it and how we negotiate this exit that, that is what really matters today. Um, Richard, I wonder if, if you've got anything to sort of feed back in terms of some of the things Volker's saying very, you know, retrospectively and thinking about moving forward now in terms of some of the key issues that, that we need to, to think about. Well, whatever view you take of the efficacy of referenda, the decision was taken. Parliament asked the people, should we stay or leave? And we decided to leave. And the Prime Minister, who argued very softly for Remain, Theresa May is now leading our negotiations, subject to her government being re-elected on the 8th of June uh, at the election. And therefore there was a dialogue, it takes a two-year process and we need to negotiate the way of exit and what is our continuing relationship with Europe after that in terms of trade, in terms of intra-European migration rights, in terms of security and so on, and uh, those will be difficult and protracted because a lot of the people who are invested in the future of the European project, the Eurocrats, as people describe them, uh, uh, want to see Britain punished for leaving because they don't want to see other people follow where Britain has led. And reform of the EU as it exists is not on the table, which largely explains, uh, or partially explains rather, Britain's decision to leave because David Cam's attempt to renegotiate our relationship didn't come to anything and people therefore rejected his advice, 52% on a 75% turnout, uh, decided that they would reject his advice and leave. So. Um, uh, a lot of people, in large numbers in France, the 49% the, the, the of people voting in the first round of the French presidential election voted for candidates who are opposed to the present day EU, two of which wish to leave the EU and take uh, 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 France out of the, the Euro. Uh, Germany, historically one of the most pro-European, there's a growing minority against, similarly in uh, the Netherlands. And Europe really needs to change. And one of the reasons explaining Britain's uh, uh, leaving is uh, uh, a fact that people thought here it wasn't fit for purpose. 
And a lot of that reflects a belief, yes, in the sense that citizens don't feel uh, part of it. They don't feel an affinity, although we are simultaneously British and European because we can travel everywhere. 1.2 million British citizens live in the EU27. 3 million European Union citizens live here and their futures need to be decided as a result of the renegotiation of our relationship. So it's very complex, but I think citizens do feel a part of it. They were part of the conversation. Everybody lies in elections. The media reports those lies and, 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 and misrepresentations because that's what elections are about. Politicians wish to win, whether they're asking you to leave or to stay or whether to vote Conservative or Labour or Liberal Democrat or SNP. So uh, it's very complex and fraught um, but um, and contested. The whole nature, nature of what is our place and what is... Uh, 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 everybody's place in the European Union is a matter for, for, for national conversation. And we're having that. We had that last year. It's an ongoing discussion. And subsequent to the election choice we make in terms of electing a new government in June, that process will continue. It's a process, not a moment. And we don't yet know what the outcome will be. It's very, very complex, I think, because whilst there is this progression to move things forward, there is this sense of reflection and making sense of things as well. Sophie and HJ, I understand there's a lot of reflection going on. Um, and also, if you haven't voted, I'd like to return to our conversation about the EU being fit for purpose. So if you haven't clicked on that widget, then let us know what you have to say, yes, no or not sure. Sophie and HJ, what are people talking about? Uh, well, we've got lots of different threads of conversation. So if you are finding it quite fast, like I do, remember, as Karen said, the little pin in the corner helps you uh, scroll through it manually so it doesn't run away from you. But um, I like uh, what Davin said. Um, he wonders how much the fragmentation of uh, the uh, UK has had a bearing on being disconnected or connected with the EU. And we're also talking about... Um, how uh, flexible the EU is, so whether or not uh, it's too rigid for uh, some countries and whether solidifying might lead to some more countries leaving as well. And uh, a lot of thoughts on uh, telling lies in politics and uh, trying to actually find out the real issues and the truth as well. There's a lot of distrust, actually. Um, Alex um, made a good point that kind of sums up what I think as well. Um, I get the impression that politics are for personal or party gain and not for the greater good of the people or the country. And uh, I, I do sort of agree. I, I think I'm very sceptical now of, of any political agenda in, in general, you know. So uh, I think there's a lot of that going on in the chat as well, which is uh, it's nice to see I'm not the only one. <laughs> it might be interesting to think about the Leave vote as well in the context of voting for less politics as well, if people are yeah. not uh, trusting of politicians. I'm not sure what we think about that. But, yeah, lots of great chat going on here. It's harder to say no than yes sometimes, and change is in itself difficult. Often we want to hold on to nurse for fear of something worse. So if you are voting for change, it's because you're genuinely unhappy with the status quo. If you're happy, you don't change. So um, I think most people agree that the EU, is, as it presently exists, is not fit for purpose. I imagine if David Cameron had tried to save his political career by asking a question before renegotiation, do you support the present day EU or like it be reformed, he'd have had a large mandate to go and renegotiate our terms, which he didn't have and wasn't able to get. Well, uh, Richard, our audience, let's see what the results are for um, our question, is the EU fit for purpose? Because our audience are saying that they do think that it is largely fit for purpose. So 45% are saying yes, they do. We also ask them, why do members join the EU in the first place? And this really is about, um, you know, to whom it is benefiting. Um, now, let's see if we've got the results for that, because when we looked last, we were um, talking about benefiting themselves primarily. Um, so we'll see if we can pull that up in one second. 61% are saying to benefit themselves, um, whereas seven, sorry, 6% are to benefit um, Europe, and then uh, the remainder are talking about benefit to both. So clearly there's something about joining something to benefit one's own country, but equally arguing that the EU is fit for purpose, is, is what our audience is saying. Are those compatible views? Well, the, the second one is indicative of British public opinion generally that we join to advantage ourselves but also to help our European friends and neighbours because they are still friends and neighbours even when we leave if we do. Uh, in terms of fit for purpose the, the data is slightly different to, to citizens. I mean the more educated you are folks the more likely you are to be pro-European <laughs> the better off you are the more likely to be pro-European uh, 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 and so on. So uh, uh, it's not exactly a reflective audience. 90% uh, of academics wanted to stay <laughs> last June so 
uh, 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 there's a difference of opinion depending on where you sit. Um, but I think it's a, it's a process that, uh, apart from the Scots who have a different perspective or a minority of the Scots who have a different perspective, nobody is talking about leaving the European, or leaving the United Kingdom. You can't leave the United States. Some states try to do so and they had a civil war about it and compelled their continuing membership. The thing about the European Union is that technically we've, we've pulled sovereignty with regard to certain policy competencies, not surrendered it. If you pull sovereignty, you can reclaim it and use it. And so that's what we're trying to do uh, in terms of the British uh, political establishment. Uh, uh, where we lead, others may follow. Uh, Europe may, may reform itself. The Eurozone may collapse. It's unstable, but we don't know. Mm. Can I just say, uh, first of all, I want to say something about, about politics and why it might matter. And I'm, I'm slightly worried about the cynicism that exists about politics, that everybody's in it for themselves. Of course they are. I mean, of course we all are. I mean, who isn't? I mean, I'm not in it for somebody else. But the, but the point is that the advantage of politics is that you get choices, that people mobilise, that you do get the sorts of debates that might that might happen. And I think actually party politics is quite important in that sense, because that's how you mobilise collectively to put different options, to, to raise different questions, to generate the sort of debate. If you didn't... It, I mean, it's interesting just to step back and say, well, what if you didn't have that? What if it wasn't like that? What if you didn't have these self-interested people making points about what they wanted to do and what they wanted to see? I think then you'd see a, a system that would, be, that would be much less attractive. And I think it's actually quite important to recognize the importance of allowing, of, of, of being part of, of taking advantage of the fact that you've got people putting different sorts of positions. And that doesn't mean you agree with them. That doesn't mean you want to go along with them. And it, the question of whether people are lying or not is an interesting one because they every. I mean, politics is about trying to put a position across, and I think in the in the referendum debate there were lies on both sides, if you want to call them lies, and that you know that's that's something that needs to be needs to be remembered. But I think there are some there are some fundamental issues being debated, which I you know I took a particular view. I think I was probably one of the ninety percent. But I mean, I think the the the, the important point. That, the important point to me is to actually look at some of the tensions that existed, and, and Richard's talked about some of those, but I think there were others as well. I mean, if you look at the way in which the vote actually played out um, geographically across across the UK and across England and Wales, as well as between uh, between England and the rest of the other countries of the of, 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 of the UK, I think is very, is very interesting, because what it suggests is that actually there were clusters of places where people did see themselves as being advantaged, of having advantages for being in the relationship. So London had a very high vote to remain. And that, that's a mix of different sorts of interests. I mean, some of which, one, some people have argued that London has, London, parts of London benefited because that was the way the debate was always constructed through London. London was the place that was benefiting the, the, the city in particular, and that constructed a sort of bubble in which no other ideas were allowed to be discussed. That's one of the things that's been argued quite strongly. But you also have in London, you have a whole different sort of population, which is not just those elites, but a range of other people who are, see themselves as benefiting from having been connected into the European networks. If you look at some of the other regions of the UK and nations of the UK, you'll find different sorts of engagement. I think actually one of the things that the European Union, or the, certainly in its, in its economic phases earlier, in terms of supporting particular forms of restructuring of industry, particularly the old coal and steel and so on community, but then that also went into the EEC and so on, was also part of reshaping those regions, actually restructuring those regions and effectively reducing um, the economic strength of those regions because there, was, there were issues about concentration, issues about rethinking what sort of industries were possible. And that actually did disadvantage some of the people living in those regions. And it's not surprising, therefore, that some of those people uh, thought that actually the European Union wasn't its friend, wasn't their friend. So I think it, it's interesting to think through the logic of, of some of the debates and to think through not just in terms of you know, the immediate present, but actually to think through what it might mean about where the UK is going in the longer term as well, in or out of the UK. What does it mean? I mean, is, this a, is, is leaving the European Union going to resolve the question of the role of the City of London in the policy making of, of where the UK goes? Does leaving the UK mean that there will be uh, tensions within the nations of the UK? What does it mean for the regions of England, which, were, which are not part of London and the South East, those other regions? What does it mean 
it seems to me that the vote shows up some of those things, but so does the debate that we're engaged in now. What will happen next is really, is really important. That's a fantastic point, and I'd like to end by just asking your two perspective on this, because our next session um, is about uh, the impact of this on the region, so it's a lovely way to lead into that. And I know there's plenty more to talk about, but Volker and Richard, is there anything you'd like to say about Alan's points, about how, how, how this might impact and, and actually what's going on in the UK in terms of the ideas that matter to people in terms of how they vote and, and perhaps also the, the impact of government on those? Okay, I mean, just the point that that I that made me think about, uh, you know, in the immediate aftermath of the referendum, it was kind of interesting. Some of the stories that were coming out about some of some of the regions uh, when you know, kind of were. Uh, confused about uh, the continuance of EU funding to to those particular regions. So, it is, you know, as soon as it started to emerge that EU funding would be discontinued, there was all of a sudden a kind of almost like a waking up to the reality of what what uh, what Brexit would actually mean to funding. Um, I think it's interesting, you know, the rural areas, in particular, who receive a great deal of the farming subsidies that the EU pays, uh, were mostly voting 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 to leave. So it's kind of interesting again about. You know, because we, we assume that people vote because of the economy. You know, that's it's the economy. Stupid is a, is a kind of very, very uh, clear sort of um, uh, you know slogan that's kind of used to 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 characterise that. And but actually, what seems to have happened is that people voted in a way that's actually not in their economic interest because. I suppose we'll have to see what the process ultimately entails and, and what the government response is and, and whether or not you know, EU subsidies to farming will be replaced or EU subsidies to, 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 to science uh, is another example. You know, whether these will actually be replaced or whether there will actually be massive cuts in the amount of funding that is, is received by those regions. So actually, you know, just to extend the point, I agree with everything you said, uh, uh, and I've learned something new as well from, from, from what you said as well. But, but it's the question about, you know, that on one hand, we, you know, we know that it's austerity overall and, 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 and cuts and, and so on have certainly contributed to the perception of the EU as the kind of cause of a lot of this, this you know, that was a kind of one of the kind of narratives that was, um, you know, um, avail you know was, was there at the referendum. But you know, what's interesting now to see is what will happen once Britain has left the EU, you know, and uh, the replacement of the, of the funding that, uh, that, that regions were receiving is no longer there. And, and it'd be very interesting then to, to see whether that might actually cause there to be a, a kind of a, 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 a pro, pro return to the EU backlash uh, in, in the aftermath of, of Brexit. Um, so that's one point I want to make to, to Ireland. I just wanted to sort of comment very briefly on the on the um, on the proportion of uh, people who 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 who, uh, who thought the EU uh, was fit for purpose, and there were 30 percent were undecided. And I think that again, um, you know, makes me think that there is an issue about first of all. How, what people know about the EU and how much of it they, are, they understand and, and how, how much they trust the information that they're giving, given about the EU. And that, to some extent, is, is, is one of the issues for the reform of the EU that Richard talked about, is to what extent can the EU uh, in, you know, reform in a way that makes the EU more transparent um, and, uh, and, and more me is more meaningful to, 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 to the people in the individual um, countries. Um, well, um, the vote was to leave the European Union, not to leave Europe. Uh, when we discussed this in 1975 in the first referendum, should we stay something we joined two years previously, there was a lot of the no vote then was what was called of a little Englander, that the world stopped at Dover and we didn't really want to think about Johnny Foreigner. Uh, that, I think, is not part of the discussion now. I think a lot of the Leave campaign was saying one of the arguments in favour of coming out of the EU is to go into the world. I don't think that was just a slogan. Um, what's interesting is that one of the things we need to decide very quickly once the negotiations start in July is what happens to the three million EU citizens who are presently in the United Kingdom and the 1.2 million EU, UK citizens who are in the rest of the EU. And what was interesting is that a, a, a poll of Leave voters, some 70%, said that they should all stay. Um, what people wanted to do was very few people wanted to stop immigration full stop. What they wanted to do was to regulate, regulate it, to manage it, to, to, to measure it, to control it. Uh, and so going forward, if there's goodwill on both sides, then I think a proper relationship 
between us and our European partners will be formed. I do worry as a citizen that there is a, a, a minority of people within the European institutions that wish that Brexit to be painful for Britain in order to punish us for leaving. And I think that's greatly damaging, not just to us, but to Europe. Uh, uh, and the European Union. So we'll wait to see. But I think goodwill on both sides is what you need in any divorce. Uh, but in any divorce, you have you lawyer up and you either you either have a good fight or you have no fight. Uh, uh, and you either try both to win or you both try to lose. So let's hope we don't burn the house down, folks, and uh, put the children into care. Um, but it's possible that will happen. But we wait to see. And I'm sure that won't be the last of what we have to say on all of this. But um, Alan, Volker, Richard, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, as Richard says, um, you know, the regions might mean different things. And, and so in our next session, we're going to take a look at the impact um, of Brexit on the regions. Um, but as Richard also said, you know, we, we voted to, to leave the EU, not necessarily Europe. Let's take a trip to the hot desk and see what you've been saying. So. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of this is a little bit, whew, but it is a really good chat going on in there. Um, I know it is moving very quickly, so do remember the pin button. Um, and also, if we do miss anything and you have any urgent questions, please email us, studenthub at open.ac.uk, or you can tweet us at studenthublive, um, and we'll try and get those answered for you ASAP. Um, I know Hey Share is a lot more, <laughs> you, you're a lot more equipped to deal with this than I am, so... Go, fire away. Who's Who are you impressed with? Um, I'm, well, mainly with um, Davin and Chris for quoting uh, Yes Minister about fighting for British sausage. So, um, oh, I, I don't think... <laughs> <laughs> I do wonder what that was. <laughs> but uh, I think Chris um, had a good point. We were talking about the purpose of the EU and whether it's fit for purpose, but what actually the purpose is. And I think that's what um, a lot of people... Uh, within the EU, will be asking at the moment going forward with Brexit, what you know, what's what's next? And um, going from Richard's point about the quotes, you know, going from the EU and into the world, um, we've been talking about um, whether Britain's economically weaker, or is there an upper hand in the EU with um, the 27 standing together? Uh, Denzel reckons that the, this will make the EU stronger, perhaps more solidified. I think we um, talked in our previous uh, Brexit discussion about um, how the UK uh, sort of has been holding back the EU on certain issues like um, uh, more security integration. Yeah, it will be interesting. We do talk a lot about how it's going to affect us, mm. but it's also interesting to think about how it affects everyone else. You know, the EU, not just the EU, but um, the Commonwealth has been mentioned and things like that. And we sort of focus very much on how it's going to affect us, but it would be quite interesting to see how the rest of the world react to it as well. So um, I do like that point. And I, I, I also like uh, Giuseppe's point about the lack of knowledge. I agree. I really don't know much about the EU so um, and I, I know I should but I don't think it's really you know we don't get taught a lot about it and I, I do think more education on the politics behind it and the actual facts rather than necessarily what politicians say um, I think that needs to be taught a lot more because mm. there's quite a lot of um, misunderstandings. Mm. I think definitely, I think from from the chat, um, we're just talking about all the questions and all the issues that are coming up. So what about implementing border controls and um, uh, practical problems about law and how different things are going to be established? What the roles of politicians going to be? Was the EU holding them back and can we hold them into account? So lots of great questions. And um, Davin brought up a question earlier about whether the uh, fragmentation of the UK's state and devolution and things like that affect how we feel connected to the EU. So uh, perhaps we'll get that answered by our panellists now. That would be well, great. There, are, um, there is actually, I've looked at the map, there's mm. lots of us all scattered around the country. So if you are in uh, one of the nations or if you've lived in one of the nations or anything like that, please do pop your questions forward to us for the next session um, and we'll try and get those answered for you. Thank you. That's lovely. And it is one of these things, you know, like you can have an opinion about things. And there are lots of new people here at the Student Hub Live as well. Um, so, you know, you can talk about whatever you want. And as Sophie was saying, you know, you don't necessarily have to have an educated opinion. Half of the enjoyment about being at these events is actually learning something and being able to say things out loud and, and talk to other people who are studying um, and also academics. I know who are in the chat today about some of those things that matter. So if you are new to the Student Hub and you think, oh, a lot of this is very highbrow or very sensible, please put your comments in the chat and, and say what you think, because as we were saying beforehand, this can relate to us at a very personal level as well as an academic and institutional one also.